So without ion channel modulators, we could not feed or close the world. All the major insecticides target ion channels. Which is the pointer? How did you find the pointer here? Oh, this one. So all the major insecticides target ion channels. Nicotine and the neonicotinoids work on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. The polychlorocycloalkans and the fipronils work on GABA channels. Impuritroids keep voltage-gated sodium channels open. Insecticides are typically highly insect-specific. In many ways, thanks to the work of John Cassida at UC Berkeley, whom I still had the privilege of meeting a couple of times. John and his students did really outstanding work in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s to design insect selective compounds in the absence of any structural and initially genetic information. But bad things happen when poison is unselective, which is why NIH has this counteract program which has the mission of developing countermeasures against chemical threat agents. Chemical threat agents would be organophosphates, chlorine gas, vesicants like sulfur mustard, some really highly toxic strange compounds, and more lately, weaponized fentanyl and carfentanyl. We have a counteract center at UC Davis, which is how we came to work on TETS. TETS goes into the really weird stuff category. So here you see TETS. It is tetramethylene disulfotetramine. It is a so-called caged convulsant because the structure is cage-like. It is an old rodenticide that has been banned because it's just too toxic to humans. It causes really nasty, long-lasting seizures. And survivors often develop epilepsy and psychosis. Despite being banned, TETS has remained around. Between 1991 and 2010, a total of 14,000 intoxications with 932 deaths have been reported in China, mostly through adulterated food or drink, like, for example, here in these kindergarten rivalries. There have been occasional cases in the US with illegally imported TETs. And what I personally find really disturbing is this patent that my graduate student found where TETs is used as an anti rat bite coating cable, a uh, coating for car cables. So that's probably in your car. So why is TETs so toxic? It is a GABA antagonist like picrotoxinin. But the LD50 for TETS is 0.2 milligram per kilo, very, very consistent in literature. In contrast, the LD50 for picotoxin varies widely between 3 to 50 milligram per kilo. And as a little aside, in the 50s, picotoxin was used as an antidote for barbiturate poisoning. In one heroic case report, a patient received five milligrams of picotoxin every 15 minutes for three days and survived after taking all of this. But why is TETS so toxic? Does it have other targets in addition to GABA receptors? Does it have a different GABA subtype selectivity than picotoxinin? Or are the differences pharmacokinetic in nature? The answer to the first question is no, at least as far as we can tell. Uh, TETS in our hands had no effect on any other ion channel associated with seizures or epilepsy, not sodium channels, not various potassium channels, not glycine receptors. We also submitted it to the psychoactive drug screening program at Mental Health, where it was tested on 320 GPCRs, and it did absolutely nothing. The program told us that they had rarely seen such a clean negative. So we started to look at GABA receptors. My student, Brandon Presley, recombinantly expressed various alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-4, and alpha-6 combinations. 
His GABA EC50s and his pharmacology was in good agreement with literature. So we had correct incorporation of gamma and delta subunits. So then we proceeded to test TETS and picotoxinin at GABA EC90. And TETS does indeed have a different subtype selectivity from picotoxinin. It prefers alpha 2, beta 3, gamma 2, and alpha 6, beta 3, gamma 2, which we believe are the major seizure-inducing targets of TETS. This was confirmed in zebrafish by the line lab where TETS-induced seizure-like behavior could be prevented, or at least mitigated, by alpha-2 and alpha-6 selective GABA palms. My student also mapped the binding site of TETS on the alpha-2, beta-3, gamma-2 receptor using Rosetta ligand. TETS is binding here in the pore of the receptor channel at the so-called trionine ring. This is what used to be called the non-competitive antagonist site in older literature. One of the mutations we made was mostly uh, the T6-threonine here to cysteine in the beta and in the alpha subunit to methionine. Since we had made the cysteine modification, which is breaking this hydrogen bond, we of course had a reviewer who had to point out um, that we should make a cysteine modification and reintroduce a new hydroxy group to reconstitute the binding site. We felt that there really was no space to do this. So instead of modifying the channel, we modified the TETS molecule. And especially when you remove the sulfon here, you can again drastically reduce TETS activity. Okay, this was all fun science, but the difference in potency to picotoxinin is not that big. So why is TETS so toxic? And at this point, we were really left with PK. There's certainly a difference in stability. TETS is stable in aqueous solution for months. Picotoxinin, in contrast, hydrolyzes quickly to picotoxic acid, as demonstrated by Latika Singh in my lab. So the differences in LD50 in literature are probably largely driven by how quickly people proceeded from making solution to dosing animals. We did PK for picotoxinin with very freshly prepared solution. It has a short 15 minute half-life. It has the highest concentration in the liver followed by plasma and brain. The dose we gave, two milligram per kilo, was probably around TD50. Half of our animals had seizures and a few died. But actually based on these brain concentrations, we can postulate that just blocking 10 to 20% of GABA current is sufficient to trigger seizures. So what about TETS? For TETS, the HAMOG lab has both a GCMS method which is not very sensitive because TETS ionizes badly. And they also have a very, very sensitive ELISA with a polyclonal rabbit antibody. But then things started to be weird. Here we gave TETS IV, and we just wanted to get the volume of distribution and meet a milestone about the equivalence of the two analytical methods. When we saw the TETS plasma concentrations were just level, they were flat. So then we followed TETS for longer. Here we're using the so-called TETS SE model where you pre-treat mice with rilosol and then rescue them with midazolam. And again, the TETS plasma concentrations flatline. For 48 hours, we are around 400 nanogram per mil, which is 1.6 micromole and then concentrations slowly fall over the next two weeks. What the ELISA is detecting here is active TETS. If we make a brain extract and perfuse it over GABA receptors, this is 10 minutes brain extract, two days, there is significant inhibition here. Same with serum, two days, 14 days. How is this possible? How can a compound with such a low log P 
and such a low plasma protein binding persists like this. The only way this can happen is, this, is if there's a transporter in the kidney that reabsorbs it and probably also takes it up into the brain. So we went transporter hunting, and since we don't typically work on transporters, we outsourced this to Xenotech, a CRO in Kansas, that tested tests on a battery of drug transporters. But unfortunately, TETS is not a substrate for any of the usual drug transporters. So now we need to either identify the transporter, and there's only about 3,000 choices, or we need to come up with something to neutralize TETS, a nanobody or another type of binding protein. So far, the best we have is a single chain that binds to TETS with micromolar affinity, which is a nice first step, but it's not potent enough for in vivo work. So this story is to be continued if we can find some more funding for it. But I had also promised you plastic explosive in the title. While we were working on TETS, here you see TETS, I said PESA came back from an EPA panel. EPA is an environmental protection agency. And this panel had spent an entire day debating a single slice recording to determine whether RDX is reversible. So RDX is a royal demolition explosive. It is a major component of plastic explosives. It is actually very safe without a detonator. You can transport it, and you can even burn it without exploding which is why it's very widely used for both military and civilian purposes. What got us interested is that during the Vietnam War, RDX intoxication was the most common cause of generalized seizures in US service personnel. And it was common knowledge among field troops that consuming small quantities of RDX would produce a high similar to ethanol. The EPA cares about RDX because where it has been used, it leaches into the soil and into the water, and then the fish, the birds, the rabbits, and the lizards have seizures. And eating of RDX has continued in some sections of the armed forces as a dare or rite of passage. So from time to time, you see these case reports a plastic explosive by mouse, peer pressure equals explosive consequences, or here status epilepticus after C4 ingestion, which was actually very nice because this paper did uh, plasma levels and EEG. So what does RDX do? In our hands, it is a reversible, non-competitive GABA antagonist that has the highest affinity to alpha-1, beta-2, gamma-2 receptors. Similar to TETS and picotoxinin, it is a pore blocker. It is, again, binding at the T6 ring in the, bore, in the pore of the receptor channel. And in this case, when we are mutating alpha-1 or beta-2 in the 2 prime or 6 prime position, we, again, can drastically reduce RDX potency. So in summary, RDX inhibits alpha-1, beta-2, gamma-2 GABA receptors, which is the most common GABA receptor in the mammalian brain, with an IC50 of 23 micromole by binding to the threonine ring in the pore of the receptor. And all this writing here just says that there is correlation between PK and PD. This IC50 is very much in line with the free plasma or the free brain concentrations you see either in patients or in rodents that have been dosed with RDX. But, there again is a but. At low concentrations, RDX is a GABA agonist. It is a positive allosteric modulator and it increases GABA currents. Very similar to allopregnanolone. So why eat RDX? Is this just young male stupidity and boredom? Because there is a very pronounced sex difference 
No intoxication has ever been reported in a female. <laughs> or do low RDX concentrations enhance the relaxing and sedating effects of ethanol? Because this PAM effect happens on all GABA receptors, including the delta-containing alpha-4 and alpha-6 receptors, which are the main target of ethanol. Or is this like 2-gen in absinthe? Alpha-2-gen is a GABA inhibitor. This was shown actually by the Cassida lab 20 years ago. And it has been proposed that there might be a small window where GABA inhibition, just a little bit of GABA inhibition, enhances neuronal excitability and balances pleasurable with the intoxicating disinhibitory and depressant effects of ethanol. And with this, I would like to acknowledge everybody who worked on this over the years, many people in the Hammock lab and in my own lab, uh, I want to really point out Brandon Presley, who did all the electrophysiology and who kept bugging me that we should work on RDX. And then, of course, our funding. None of this would have been possible without funding from the Counteract program. Thank you.